All right. Hello. Welcome to Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown, and this is a rare occasion. I am coming to you from a remote location, live from Northampton, Massachusetts, at a little secret spot called the Birdhouse that my producer Josh has. And um, I am not in my usual basement, and I am not on my usual rig. I got headphones on and some fancy mic, and it's a whole new world. like a real podcaster setup going on here. Um, I'm up here because we shot my new video. I mentioned it, and we did it. I could believe it. We made it happen, and we, we ran into some obstacles. Of course, we got a bunch of snow. And I wasn't sure if anybody was going to be able to show up, but everybody showed up and it all went off. I'm, I'm so, I'm really beside myself about the whole thing. It was really a fun experience. It was a really big challenge for me. You know, my plan, which was risky, was to not plan. (laughs) Like normally I would have wanted to prepare like, okay, what am I going to do in each session? And let's keep it really tight and focused and You know, we're going to be rolling on film and I don't want to screw up. But I thought, oh man, it's going to be too, too canned if you do that. And that's not what I would have done normally. Like if I was going to have a workshop, if I was going to go have a workshop with people, I don't usually plan out what I'm going to do in each session. I just show up and I see who's there and, and we go. And I decided that that's what I was going to do. I was just going to go have a workshop. Like I would normally go have a workshop with people. And just try to, as much as possible, ignore the aspect of it, which was filming a video. And you know what? We, we, it, it pretty much happened, I think, exactly as it would have happened, whether the cameras were there or not. And I think that everybody got over the cameras pretty quick. And it, it was really rewarding. The people who came were really open and... I was worried because I didn't know them (laughs) and we were filming and ultimately we really came together and I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful to everybody who's involved, to all the people who came and participated. I'm grateful to the the tech guys who were there um, for hours doing it. I'm grateful to Josh. I'm grateful to Josh's wife, Jennifer, who I know is listening. Thank you, Jennifer. You were really awesome. (laughs) And... Just, oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. It's going to come out, and I'll let you know more about it soon. We're going to do some pre-sales um, later this month, and um, I'll let you know. So what else is going on? Today's talk. Today's talk is with Chase Bosart, and um, I really enjoyed uh, having this opportunity with him because Chase, he doesn't do any of this stuff. He doesn't, he's not out there. You might not have heard of him before, but you really should, and he's he's one of the guys I know who's He's really teaching something, uh, what I consider to be authentic, uh, straight from his teacher, uh, TKV Desikachar. And, you know, he learned yoga living with the Desikachar family in India. And he has a really insider perspective on what's happened with that tradition. And there was, you know, many of you who are listening maybe know um, quite a bit of scandal in that family. And, you know, some people spoke about it back when it happened, but um, this is the first time I ever heard Chase talk about it. And he, he talked about it very openly and uh, I'm just grateful to him. And you know, what else about Chase? He sees it brilliant Sanskrit scholar. He's like my go-to guy. Uh, he's not only a Sanskrit scholar, but he's like my age and he's funny, <laughs> which I appreciate. And I think you'll see from our talk that he really, he really brings something to the table. Um, and just in general, I feel like he's an example of a bigger thing that's happened. You know, we I've written about this with like the fall of the figureheads or the, the gurus at the top of the schools and, and the way that things have changed in general in the industry. Uh, Chase is going to give us a really different um, way to see that, I think. So um, that's it. I'm not going to say anything else for now. I, I'm not at home. I don't have my usual, like usually when I'm at home and I'm thinking about my life and what's going on, I, I feel like I can clue into anything that might be 
I don't know, interesting to talk about or useful to talk about. But right now, I'm, I'm like not at home. I'm not in my usual place. <laughs> it's just the workshop and, uh, and the talk. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk to Chase. Are we started already? Well, we're recording. Okay. You know, I don't know if we've started yet. Have we started? <laughs> Do you think we started? Well, I want to chant first. Do you want to chant? Yeah, so we have a little Krishmacharya uh, invocation. Hey, man. As, I, as like, as I like what that do, idea. Do, do it. Shri Krishna Vagi Shayati Shvarabhyam Samprabdha Chakrankarna Bhashya Sadam Shri Nuit Narengindra Yatau Samarpita Svam Shri Krishna Maryam Guru Varyami De Virodhe Kartya Tike ma se shatatara kreto dayam yoga char yang krishna maryam kudru varya maham bhaji shri kudru bhyo namaha just a little acknowledgement that what we're doing has come down from somewhere and we didn't make it up ourselves. Man, I couldn't have thought of a more perfect way to start our talk. You know, I have a, like some notes. I have this new thing because I recorded a podcast recently and I had this whole great conversation with somebody. And then afterwards we went out to dinner and she told me something about herself. And I was like, Are you, why didn't we talk about that? And she's like, well, you didn't ask and I didn't want to bring it up. And she's like, it's in my bio. But it was like this little mention in her bio, but I didn't read her bio. And I was like, oh. So now like, I have this new thing where anytime I'm going to have a talk with somebody, I, um, I'm going to kind of look up, look up and read their bio and stuff. Oh. So I did like a little research on you. But, oh, no. But that's, that's fine. But I learned some things back that I didn't know. Um, and what I wanted to start with to talk to you about is that, like to me, um, of everybody I've ever met, like in the professional yoga world, all mm. right? Um, like of people who are like my peer group. Like I don't know how old you are. I'm 43. How old are you? 45. 45. So you're a couple years ahead. But like basically the same, you know, group. I'm so old I have to actually think about it. How old yeah. am I? <laughs> 40 or well, uh, five. 45. Okay, of, good. Of all those people who are like my same age, yeah. you are by far the most old school to mm. me. You know what I mean? Like in terms of what you teach and how you teach. And the fact that you walked in here and like, oh, well, let's, let's give it up to Krishnamacharya, man, before we start talking yeah, about anything. That's right. I was like, that's, that's kind of yeah. amazing. So, well, thank you, Jay. You you're know. welcome. You're welcome. Well, I, I guess what I wanted to start with is that um, you know, we met at the IAYT conference in 2009, was that late? I think it was the first one, wasn't it? It was the council, the first council of schools initiative. Right. It was meeting. before that, no? No, I don't, I don't think we've met prior really, to that. That doesn't seem that long ago. I, I don't know. Somehow I just feel like I've known you a lot longer than that, well, I guess. Well, it was not too long after that that you started making mm-hmm. trips here. That's true. But I remember um, my memory, and maybe you, the, the way I tell the story, I don't know if you tell it differently. And I talked with Amy Matthews about this because Amy Matthews was in that room too. Is that you and I were kind of these like young guns in the room who were like outspoken in our opinions. This <laughs> and there was true. like our predecessors were there, you know what I mean? There are people who were ahead of us there. Yeah, we yeah. were sort of like the yeah, younger yeah. guns. Yeah, yeah. And we were both expressing our opinions virulently. And we didn't agree. We didn't agree. Like you, Let's say vehemently, please. Vehemently. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better choice of words. I'll take it. But we didn't agree. Like you were shooting for a very, very high standard of ours. And I, I was, was like, hey, yeah. we got to do this entry level thing. And we didn't agree on that. But I remember coming away thinking, oh, that guy's totally for real. And feeling like a lot of, oh, I would like to know that guy more. Yeah, I had the same response. I you know. And, um, you know, the IAYT went more in the direction that you wanted him to go. 
And yeah, that's why you're enough. one of the. What's that? <laughs> but not far. Not, far, not as far as you want. That's true, though. You were like 1,500 and they went to like 800 yeah. or something yeah, like yeah. that. But you, that's why you now are one of the official yoga therapy schools. Schools. We're an accredited school, correct? Right. So we'll get to that. <laughs> Before we get to that, though, I also wanted to um, talk to you because um, in my little bit of research, I noticed like. A couple of video blogs that you did last year. Oh, I found those. Uh oh. You for a moment. Yeah, they're pretty. You started stiff. to do a video blog, which to me is incredible because, as I said, like you're sort of the person I knew who hasn't done any of that stuff. Like, I, I like you have a little bit of a Facebook and like Twitter. I know you have the accounts, but like <laughs> I do. And every once in a while, you. you I have I, an I official notice, but account. It's, like, it's it's so <laughs> obvious how reluctant you are to do any of it. It's like it's so obvious that you don't want to do any of that. No, it's so true. And and you haven't done any of that. So in this one video blog, I think it was either the second or first one that you did. You talk about oh, I go to a party, and someone asks me what I do, and I say I'm a yoga teacher, and they immediately like dress you in tight pants and put a microphone on you. That's right. And you're like barking out this thing, and everybody's sweating. Yeah, and they're telling me what a great workout yoga is. And, and you're saying oh. And that's something that's come up, but it's usually women talking about, like, this image of a yoga teacher. Mm. Like, women, more teachers who've been teaching for longer, they're in their 30s or their 40s, and they feel like they don't fit in to what people think of as a yoga teacher because there's this idea of, like, an Instagram body yoga teacher. And so to hear you, I was like, oh, my God, well, look, here's a guy, and there's an image for a yoga teacher for him, too, you know, that's very contrary to what you do. Yeah. And so, you know, what would you say to, um, like, how have you managed to sort of stay a little bit away from that all? Like, Oh, I just don't go to parties. <laughs> <laughs> I just sit in my room and meditate all the And every once in a while, my wife and I go out for dinner or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's funny. But seriously, like, I know, like, well, you know, my, my impression this is, is, this and is you'll a correct- crusade of mine for sure. Well, my impression is this, and then I'll, I would like to hear you speak, is that, that like, you didn't really come into yoga. Like, you came into yoga totally differently than I did. Like, you didn't come into yoga going to Jiva Mukti on no. Second Avenue. No. Like, you came Where is that yoga. anyway? No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> like, your whole entrance into yoga is totally yeah. old school. So maybe we should start there. Like, right. I know you went, you went to Colgate University, right? That's right. And you studied philosophy. You have done your homework. I'm right. so impressed. So, so how did that, how did that get, take you to yoga? So I went to college, and my parents really wanted me to go out east. I, I'm a West Coast boy. I grew up in Seattle. And my parents just really had this bee in their bonnet about their sons going out east. So I obliged, and I, you know, I ended up at – there was something called the common – application you know you check boxes basically so colgate was a box that i checked and i got ex- so it was like a bunch of different universities yeah, in one like, application yeah yeah it was like colby in maine and and a few carlton in minnesota anyway i checked a bunch and then i got into a few of them not not that many but i got a few of them and my mom was like okay you have to go and i was like what so i i, I went like three separate trips to the east and from Seattle for like a weekend to like go and walk around campus and see how. And I ended up at Colgate at this thing called Sub Frosh Weekend, you know, prior to freshman year, Sub Frosh, right? Weekend. Okay. Sub frosh. And, and I was like, oh, I'm totally going here. Done. I'm going Why? Because it was like partying and fun? or like, I had a great time. I had a really great like time. And cool I just people, knew. Like what was fun? I just knew. I just. Uh, you felt at home. Yeah, probably something like that. I don't even know if it goes that far. I just because I, when I look back on my time in Colgate, I won't say that I have the most. It doesn't feel like really the a great time in my life. It feels like an important time in my life, but not like I was. Colgate is in the middle of upstate New York. It's a town of two thousand, and the school is twenty five hundred, or was when I was going there. It's small, and you know. I was definitely a West Coast boy. It's a minority out here. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm a West Coast boy, I just, too. I understand. I just didn't fit in all that well. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a rough time in our lives. That it's a rough time. It's a big you're transition. Like, you're like trying to figure out who the hell you are. That's right. And, I, and so what happened in college is I got cracked open. 
And, you know, I started asking all these questions like, well, what does that mean? Was there something when you say it got cracked open? Well, you know, you go to college, you get, a, you get, uh, you, you, you get exposed to all kinds of new ideas. Yeah. You know, I was going to be my father who was the president of the beta fraternity and, yeah. and, 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 you know, a stockbroker and, you know, uh-huh. try to make as much money as, as humanly possible, et cetera. And I got to college and I was like, whoa, whoa, who am I? Uh-huh. What am I trying to do? Jerry Garcia and the boys came through town. You know. Oh, I got on that bus for a little while. Ah, oh, so you were a deadhead. You know, I, I was, I That's was, what cracks you open. Head. I like that. <laughs> yeah, All uh, right. Can I ask, did you take a lot of acid? You cannot ask that. Oh. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. No, the answer is no, I did not. Really? No. So wait a second. You, 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 list, you went, followed the, deadhead, the, the Grateful Dead, but you didn't take acid. That's right. Wow. You just liked the music. Um, there's a few other things I like too. I see, I see. And what what do you what does that mean? What, I don't know what you mean. I, I that you know community, community. Honestly, the people you were hanging out the, with. Um, you know, there's a whole way that uh, uh, there's a whole way that Grateful Dead were a alternative perspective on what it meant to be human, mm. and is so different than what I had really been exposed to at growing up. I see. It was whatnot. a little bit like the 60s for us postmodern kids. Yeah. And your dad must have been pissed. My dad was like, what? <laughs> Haven't you heard them play before? It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> All right. So I get it. So you're in college. But I was, I was also, I was pretty, I was a fairly conservative, pretty prudish in my um sort of outlook on life and right and wrong and grew up in a, in a very strong Christian home, which I'm very thankful for, but, you know, very much indoctrinated about no sex, no drugs, no alcohol, et cetera. And, you know, until it's legal, which Mm. is when you're married or, you know, (laughs) or after 21, you can consume some alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just had kind of, when I got to college, I, I sort of had this, lack of structure and I didn't know what to do with myself and you know so I started taking philosophy courses and they're very interesting it's a whole bunch of stuff about who are you and what is your relationship to the world and how does that function and how and and how does that uh, uh, why do you suffer and then the western course ends Mm -hmm. and you just it's pretty much this is why you're screwed Okay, next class will be <laughs> like, I, whoa, wait. <laughs> I had such the same experience. I mean, I wasn't a philosophy major, but I like remember taking philosophy courses, having a similar experience. But then there was that one book was like Berman, uh, Disenchantment of the World. There was like mm-hmm. this one book mm-hmm. that sort of pointed in other directions besides. Yeah, well, f- for me, um, I, got, I took a, a Theravada Buddhist tradition course and um and a general education on india and i became aware that there was a whole nother philosophical sort of system mm-hmm. and you know i i i decided i want to go abroad and my parents had done a lot of traveling and so i'd been to a lot of places i kind of didn't want to go back to somewhere i'd been so i was like india i'll go to india mm. and it turned out that one of the courses was uh uh, yoga theory, and it was taught by this uh, man named uh, Mr. T. K. V. Deshikachar. Wait, wait. So Deshikachar was just teaching a course at Colgate? No, no, no. This is on. Oh, a, oh. I, so I went on a study abroad. Yeah, I went on a study abroad program with Colgate to India, yeah. and they had promised that I could take uh, Hindu philosophy courses and that I would Indian philosophy courses and and I had two directed readings with so I had a professor and he was like you can read this 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 that and uh, then we met once a week just me and him and talked about it and it was super fun oh it was so cool super mm. fun but one of the courses on the on the study abroad program was yoga theory and it was taught by Mr. Deshikachar in India in India in six, it was a six months course at Colgate yeah for credits. For credits, yeah. That's amazing. Is incredible. Is incredible. I, didn't even, I mean, I knew he had like visited Colgate, but I didn't know he was like... Yeah, so the, the professor that, was, that took the group, is, uh, he's now passed, but this guy named uh, Bill Skelton. And man, what a character. 
what a character. He um he had this this flamboyant uh style and he became a he he's a music professor and he became interested in in music in India, Indian music. And he started studying something called the Nagaswara, which is this double reed instrument that's used in rituals. And he became the first non-Indian to study that. And yeah, he, you know, he really had this flair about him. And he, he just, he made a lot of inroads into India and he spent a lot of time there. And he basically could get in to see anybody he wanted at any time. And um, along the way, his wife got really interested in yoga and became first a student of Krishmacharya's and then became a student of Mr. Deshikachar's after Krishmacharya stopped seeing foreigners. Mm. And so every they, the study abroad program happened every other year. And so they went for like six months to Chennai every other year for, I don't know, 20 some odd years. Mm. So, and Mr. Deshikachar taught as a favor to um, Mary Lou Skelton was her name, uh, this this course for the Colgate students. And that's how Gary Craftsaw became... Through the same program. Through the same program. Mm. And that's also Kate Holcomb. Right. Um, so all three of us really got um, introduced to Mr. Desha Kachar as a result of being at Colgate, wow. which comes back to this first thing where you said, you know, well, how come you decided at Subfrosh weekend, like, this is what you're going to do? And I really won't say, like, you know, oh, I had the best time ever. It was gonna, I mean, I had a good time, but I just knew, like, I'm going here. I'm, I'm, going, to co- I'm going to this college. Some gut and like, like and oh, this my, is the one. I went home. That, I went home. My mom's like, all right, next weekend we're going. Like, mom, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going there. Hmm. She's like, you sure you need to get out? I was like, mom, I'm not going. <laughs> this is where I'm full stop yeah so that was really my introduction to yoga which is pretty interesting because uh i really had i had taken a few asana courses or classes with mary lou skelton um what year was that do you remember 1991 91 see 91 there weren't yoga classes like yeah there weren't she had the upstate yoga institute in syracuse new york which is still being run um it's still it's still there, and uh, uh, Martine and and David uh, Jacobs are uh, are running it, and I mean it's still it's still there, you know, thirty odd years wow. after she founded it. Awesome. So anyway, I'd, I'd taken a few yoga classes, yeah, and I went on the study abroad program, and you know, really. So how long were you in India? Six months. Six months was yeah the, the thing. Fr- initial thing, yeah, and you stayed with Deskacha. Well, we we stayed in the New Woodlands Hotel, okay, and uh, which is right, you know, it's uh, it was like a you know a ten minute bike ride okay. to the Mandaram, to Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandaram, yeah. and twice a week we would go for this hour and a half class, and twice a week for an hour and a half, yeah. And so there's this very diminutive little Indian man. I mean, if you ever met Mr. Deshi, I, I, not he's, like so he's personally, he's so he's he's well, he's not a he's not a large man, no, and he's just he's so normal. Yeah. He's so normal. So he would come in and he would just, he was so relaxed. And, but here he was like un, unveiling, like, okay, here's who you are. This is your relationship to the world. This is how it functions. And the really, the kicker for me was, and this is what to do about it. Mm. In other words, it was like not only the descriptive that we are getting from our Western philosophy courses, but also this incredible practical, usable principles and tools for how to bring yourself out of suffering. I was like, oh, 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 oh. God, do I need this? <laughs> I yeah. need this. Yeah. So I had one semester left in college because it was my senior year that I went abroad. And I came back, I graduated, and I went straight back to India for another six months and studied at the Mandaram. And Mr. Deshikachar saw me privately. Huh. And uh, now, wait before you go on. Yeah. So you spent another six months, and you worked one to one with Deshikachar. Yeah. And you also made a comment earlier that I wanted to just touch back on briefly when you said Krishnamacharya decided to stop teaching Westerners. Yeah. And I'm curious about that because it seems like you were you just missed him. 
You know what I mean? He, like he like passed. it was a generation just before you yeah. that he stopped teaching Westerners. He was still alive. He was still alive. But I don't I don't the the history of it is not uh something I'm very strong on. I see. So um But you know that at some point he stopped teaching Westerners. Yeah. And, you know, he passed in 1989, and I arrived in 1991. Okay. So it was, a, you know, 18, I think it was about two years, not okay. quite two years that he'd passed when I arrived. I see. And, but, you know, I mean, I had, no, I had no idea. It wasn't like I was interested in yoga, and I did this research, and I found out that Mr. Iyengar's um, uh, mm-hmm. father, I mean, Mr. Iyengar's brother-in-law was the one who had been teaching him, and that he was still alive, and he had a place yeah. in Chennai, and, <laughs> yeah. and his son, his yeah. son, Mr. Deja Gachar, was the director of that. I had no there idea. There was no I internet. Just, we wouldn't have known no, any of I that. I just, like, I landed in Chennai, and I was found myself in these classes, and there's this very humble man just like unveiling the secret of life. And I was just like, whoa, okay. Mm. And plus we had, I think three days a week, we had an asana class at the Mandram mm. led by some of the teachers. Right. So it was just, you know, one, two punch. I was so hooked when you're I went in, back. In. I was just in. And then so six months later, you come back to Seattle? No, I came back to Chennai. But I mean, you after you... You finished school and okay, then you went, went back there for six yeah. months. Then and you then you came back to the United States. I came back to the United States. And where did you go? I went, yeah, I, I went off the track. <laughs> I oh, went, that's right. This is the China, China I went expedition. To, so how does this happen? Tell us what happened. <laughs> yeah, so I went to Colorado where my uncle was a uh, surgeon in Vail. So I lived with my aunt and uncle in this really lovely house. And was a ski bum for the winter. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. and then um, I couldn't look my dad and mom in the eye and say, thank you for the Colgate education. I'm going to be a yoga teacher. <laughs> they weren't going to take, I, I wasn't going was to cut it, huh? I just couldn't do it. You know, it's, my parents actually, um, I think... After they got over the initial shock, they would have been pretty supportive of it. But, mm-hmm. you know, because um, they, they supported all kinds of stuff. I mean, they were ridiculously supportive. So they would have done it. But it, it was an internal thing, and I just couldn't do it. So I looked my mom and dad in the eye, and I said, I'm going to get a Ph.D. in Indian philosophy. <laughs> I see. So the other option besides telling them <laughs> that you were going to just be a yoga teacher was to get a graduate degree. Right, because, you know, uh, um, advanced degrees are always legitimate. <laughs> At least you could be a professor. Yes, and I could be you could supported. Be tenured. I could be supported, and I could live the kind of life that I would like to live and, You're not and going to teach some yoga in the side. millions like your dad. You can be a scholar. Right. Okay, got it. Millions is a little strong, but, you know, make okay, some money. Okay, so <laughs> I gotcha. My dad <laughs> made millions and lost millions. And, yeah, 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 my dad used to say, easy come, easy go. <laughs> Want to make a small fortune? Start with a large one. <laughs> I remember my dad had the T-shirt in the 80s that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> and he was so proud of that shirt. <laughs> I look back on it now. <laughs> You're like, this is where this I came the from. <laughs> this is why, the directions we go in, right? This is so the true. This is like, we go in. No wonder we came to yoga. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's part of it, right? That's exactly right. right, right. So, um, so what happened? I got so you to, go into business doing what? No, so I got oh, you go, to. You went to get your degree. I went. I, I applied to schools, and um, I got into UC Santa Barbara Religious Studies Department, which is a fairly highfalutin department. And I got there and I realized that I didn't share any of the perspective of the guys who did Indian philosophy. Hmm. So, um, and not only that, but I didn't feel comfortable because there was a real emphasis on objectivity. So the philosophy, the Indian philosophy that was being taught for your graduate degree, like wasn't what you were getting from Desikachar. Correct. I mean, it's very fun. To, like I, the first year I was there, I took Sanskrit, and 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 um, I also had a graduate course on translating the Yoga Sutras, and we translated the first um, chapter and all Vyasa's commentary. This was the grad in the in, you know 
mm-hmm. the first year I was there. So Vyas, who's Vyas? Vyas is the uh, main commentator on uh, the Yoga Sutra. So you, okay. you, it's almost it, it's almost as if it's considered part of the text because it, it's so integral. So you have Yoga Sutra, and then you have this long commentary after they get the next Yoga Sutra, long commentary. So the commentary is Vyasa, but... And is Vyasa not Patanjali? I'm a little he's confused. He's not Patanjali. So he's just some so other dude. So there's a sutra that, that Patanjali wrote, and then there's this other little thing that somebody named Vyasa wrote. Yeah, that's explaining in more detail. And it's considered part of the sutras in a way. Over time, it's become like the main... It's become the main uh, explanation of what these pithy little statements that Patanjali is supposed to mean. Because what Patanjali has presented is a kind of curriculum. It's a teaching outline. Mm. It's 195 lines of, okay, here's the big topic. But none of the little... Bullet points. Yeah, none of the the, details are there. So you have to know what the details are, or you have to learn from somebody who understands the whole course of the... Yoga and, and then it, be able to unpack sorry, it. Is it is I've not heard this before. And is it this Vyasa portion? Is that thought to be written around the same time, much later? Well, it's not clear. Mm. It's not clear. So, um, so if anyways, I remember go- correctly, it's four four hundred years later or something like that. All right. Western scholars peg um, Patanjali at somewhere between three hundred and three fifty CE, Common Era. Uh. So that's like eight hundred years after the Buddha, uh. and. Um, then uh, Vyasa is a few hundred years after that, but I don't really remember. Okay, but so you're you're in the class and they're teaching you to translate that. So the second sutra is Yogaha Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, right? So so this is the definition of yoga according to Patanjali. So the words are uh, you can you can get different um, you get different meanings based on context. It's a little bit like Will will have the will to sign the will, right? It's the same <laughs> right. word. It's, gotcha, the, it's gotcha. the same word, but it's four different contexts. It has four different meanings, right? So, um, nirodaha is a kind of a tricky word, and it can be a lot of different things. So, Mr. Desha Kachar translates nirodaha almost like focus. He says the defi- Patanjali's definition of yoga, yogaha, chitta vritti nirodaha, is. The directing of the activities of the mind in a chosen direction and maintaining it. Yeah. And then I was in graduate school and they're translating Nirodha as cessation. Mm. So you get yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of mind, right? So in so one it's like yoga is directing the mind, it's meditation, and the other yoga is like eliminating the mind. You have it's like Cessation or something. One's possible and one's not. <laughs> and that, that was totally me. That was totally my complete interjection of opinion. Forgive me. No, I, but I shared the opinion. So I was like this fish out of water in the, in the academic place because I was uh. like, what the hell is this? Yeah. This is not practical. How do you apply this? I did, you know. But so interesting to me because that's always been my thing. Like, you're much more of a scholar than me, but I, I, what I've noticed in my scholarship that I have done is that there are no, different viewpoints and different interpretations yeah. and different translations of the same texts. Yeah. I always say this in like, I've got five different translations of the sutras on my shelf. And yeah. depending on which one I pick up, I will get a completely different idea about that's, what yoga that's exactly is. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. But that's, I mean, that's what happens in translation. That's what happens in, you know, interpretation. It's, there's the text. and then So you went to school to learn how to translate yourself. I did, yeah. I have three years of graduate level Sanskrit, wow. and uh, I also had a year in India later of learning how you know learning in a traditional way, which is basically memorization. <laughs> it says like he chants, you listen, you repeat, <laughs> pretty much, basically, pretty much. And then he says no well, again, <laughs> pretty much. And, <laughs> and then he says now if you get up in front of everybody and you do it, right? That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right, so so let me roll so us I, along. So I got there. I got there, and I just didn't. I got to the University of Santa Santa Barbara, and I mean these really well thought of scholars, et cetera. But I just couldn't connect with them. Did you finish the program? I went two years, mm. and then in after the end of the first year. Uh, at the end of the first year, I took a course on Buddhist meditation with a guy who did Japanese Buddhism, mm. and he. That was an amazing course. Alan Grippard, 
Mm. Alan Gupard, incredible course. What a man. And it was so practical, but it was applied to Japanese. Mm. And he introduced me to a colleague that did Chinese religion stuff. And Bill Powell, Will, William Powell, Powell Wool. And it was also incredibly practical, so interesting. So yeah, I got into some like Taoist philosophy before I got into yoga too. You know, the Tao and mm-hmm. made a lot of sense. And I think there's a lot of parallels. Oh, there's the so much overlap. Thing, you know, <laughs> so much overlap. So this is why I say, you know, you, you make one bad decision and it kind of snowballs and it tracks you into the next and the next and the next. So the, what was the, the bad, bad decision? decision was not going, not just moving to India. Uh-huh. And and studying for a couple of years, th- and then coming back and teaching yoga. What I did was I went to graduate school. Yeah. And in graduate school, I didn't get really along very well. And then I got interested in this work the guy was doing in Japanese Buddhism and Chinese, Chinese religion. Buddhism, yeah. And then I started studying Chinese. So I was studying Chinese and Sanskrit at the same time. My second okay. year of, uh, of Chinese. Buddh- and- Could you pick two more ridiculously was, difficult? Yeah. It was, and mind bending right. languages to learn. Right. Pretty much. Oh, so then at the end of the second year, I went to China because I needed to like improve my language abilities to work with these guys. And that's guys. the best way to learn is just go be there just with go the people. Be right? there. And then at the end of one year in China, I had uh, pretty much through blood, sweat, and tears and you know four hours of tutor every day, I, I was able to speak. But it was one of those things where if you really want to keep your language ability, you have to stay. So yeah. I stayed for another year, but if you're going to stay for a year... What were you doing for that year after you learned how to speak? Well, my brother came after I was there about six months, and he moved into my dorm room with me. Mm -hmm. And all surreptitiously, the university didn't know he was there. He he moved in. And uh, And what was the idea? Why did he He started studying Chinese. He wanted to just travel. I see. He just needed something to do, and you're like, hey, come crash with me, man. Right. But if you, once he got to China, he recognized that if you don't speak Chinese, that you just get taken Uh. and taken and taken and taken. (laughs) And that was like too infuriating for him. Uh. So, and I mean, and the Chinese, they, I mean, basically the bus doesn't move till you pay twice the. Twice the fare. Unless you speak Chinese. And all of the, and yeah, and all the Chinese people are just sitting there waiting until you paid. I mean, and you know, I mean, it's it's tough. It's but really I tough. remember in India paying more for my ticket mm-hmm. than other people. Yeah, and not really thinking that, not really feeling begrudgingly about that because it was like five dollars. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> that's another story. I want my five dollars. <laughs> no, I, 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 I just want remember. I have a story about that because I remember at, when I went to India, like the first time we had to take a train, we went to the train station, and we wanted to buy a first class ticket. And the person at the window said, oh, sorry, there's no first-class tickets left. Right. So we had to buy, like, general-class tickets, which was hairy, which was, yeah, like, yeah. people on the roof. That's right. And it was, like, my friend is super claustrophobic. Like, we were, like, oh, my God, I don't think we can do this, you know, kind of situation. And then what we learned soon after is, like, oh, if you go to, like, any local travel agency in whatever little town and you say, I want a first-class ticket and you're willing to pay the bakshish bribe money, you then can do whatever can... you want. Yes. It's easy-peasy. All those tickets are available. You just yeah. don't go to the train station to get them. Yeah. And once we figured that out, it got easy. We just go and say, we want whatever we right. want. And it, we had money. And, and then I would meet these other Western travelers, and they'd be so upset. And I'd say, look, you guys, what train did, what, where's your seat? Did you have a comfortable train ride? How much did you pay? It's like $1.50. I was like, I paid $5. I had to sign to see. You just gotta, it's their rules, you know? It's their rules. It's their rules. You've got to be on the, the terms of That's that right. place. You can't That's be right. there on your terms. That's the way it is there. That's right. So my brother moved in, and he started studying Chinese. And after I'd been there one year, he'd been there about six months. I decided to stay for another year, and so we decided I to get still a not job. Clear. Like, so you're there, you're staying there. Oh, I Are was you at, making money there. No, I was you, in. I was in graduate school. You're studying. You're studying. I'm studying. I was studying basically seven or eight hours a day, just trying to wrap my head around. Yeah. Zhongguo, just trying to. Zhongguo. Zhongguo. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I can still speak so what are you Chinese. Saying? What did you just say? I just said I can still speak Chinese. No problem. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> somebody who speaks Chinese out there knew what you were saying. Somebody does. Yeah. yeah somebody does. All right. So you're there studying. Hi, Your Shane. brother shows up to hang out. He starts he learning Chinese. He starts learning Chinese. I decide to stay for a year. See, this is another bad decision, right? So the bad decision is you go to graduate school. Then followed by you go to China. Then you stay there for a year. You so, consider these bad decisions? Uh, well, I would consider them... 
I'm, I don't regret any of them, but yeah. I consider them decisions that resulted from an initial avidya, an initial misperception, uh. which was that I couldn't look my parents in the eye and tell them I'm going to be a yoga teacher. Huh. So you make one, you, you make a, yeah, you, no. you have, you start with avidya and the suffering is coming. It, and it's it just... rolls on from there. <laughs> it rolls on All from right. There. Well, so it's not too bad. I mean, if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.